Welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, I am joined by the king of franchising, Lance Grolick, who is the CEO of Ion Franchising. He's helped over a thousand people move into franchise ownership. He hosts a podcast. He's been a franchisee and CEO himself. Uh, he's had some pretty amazing successes in the world of franchising with, of course, franchise brands that you would know and recognize. Um, and really excited to hear about your story, Lance. So thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. And you know, when I got invited on your podcast, I was so excited because I'm on all different podcasts. And when I heard niches like strategy and leadership, those are my favorite topics. So I'm glad I'm here. Sweet. I love it. I think one of the cool things uh, I actually used to uh, of one of the random jobs that I've had, I've had a lot of jobs in my career, um, but I was a sales associate uh, for the French Canadian market for a company called Be The Boss. And so I was calling uh, franchisees who wanted to to list, uh, uh, can do some advertising there. And, and I learned a lot about the world of franchising. I think it's an exceptional model. You can do very well with the right franchise partner. Um, it's, it's certainly a different type of, of business ownership, I'll say, than your typical kind of startup growing. But it has its challenges. It has its pros. It has its cons. Um, and I think it's a really cool uh, world. But, you know, I want to hear about your experience. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about your background above and beyond what I might have shared, and we'll get into some questions. Yeah, you know, the world of investing, there's three major pillars of investing. You can, uh, I call it Wall Street, you know, stocks and what have you, uh, real estate, and then, of course, business ownership. And franchising seems to be that big black hole that many, many people today don't understand. Lots of misconceptions. Everybody thinks you have to be a millionaire to own a franchise because, you know, for McDonald's you do, but uh, I represent almost a thousand brands these days and uh, lots of opportunities. So for me, I thought I was going to work on Wall Street. You know, I had a grandfather that was a real estate attorney and investor and another grandfather that was a, a Polish immigrant. Nobody could ever understand. And he created a supermarket empire from a little corner bodega he created in New York. And dad was on Wall Street. So for me, follow dad on Wall Street. But I got bored pretty quickly, got my economics degree and said, you know, it's got to be something else. And I followed uh, another relative who called me and said, hey, I'm building this billion dollar franchise empire. Come join me in Arizona. And I helped him get that empire from nothing to 225 million by 1992. And that was with a brand called TGI Fridays in the old days. And uh, I said to myself, you know, this is a pretty cool gig. I don't have to sweat every component that you normally would in establishing a business. I'm following a roadmap, a blueprint, and if you will, I get to collaborate and mastermind with other people that have done it before in this exact brand. So I followed my own path and eventually became a, a Wingstop franchisee, a multi-state franchisee with a partner at uh, with Krispy Kreme Donuts. And then I launched had the confidence to start launching my own brands and was very successful with that. So I've also been the chief strategist, true true uh, title for many brands, sort of as a consultant, because I have, as you know, and as your listeners know, your vision for what a company needs to be is incredibly important. Someone has to have the vision. And I typically have sort of x-ray vision on a lot of different businesses, especially where I got my start in the restaurant business, which is one of the hardest industries there is. So I like to say after what I've accomplished in restaurants, if you can do it in restaurants, everything else is easy after that. So those are a couple of highlights and uh, love building businesses. I'm not exactly a maintainer, love the hard stuff. 
It's awesome. So that's pretty wild. So not only did you build this, you know, franchise system from scratch, you're doing it yourself. I have a lot of questions. You know, part of me wants to know about your journey growing such a, well, now well-known brand as TGI Fridays. What did you learn? I'm also curious because, you know, we have business owners who listen to this podcast and many of them want to like grow and scale their business. And they kind of think about it growing, scaling one, but I believe the principles are the same. The, the idea is that you duplicate your, not yourself per se, but you put a bunch of processes and systems in place such that the work can be duplicated, which really yes. is the essence of a franchise. The I guess the core is versus scaling on top of itself, you're scaling to a degree and expanding wide. So maybe I can scratch my itch for both questions as we think yeah. of the, you know, the case study for TGI Fridays. You know, yeah. how did it grow from concept to scalable idea, recognizing that, you know, the world world of restaurants is like the hardest business that you yeah. could do. So what were some lessons there that you learned? Yeah. And, and TGI Fridays, we were a franchisee. So we had territory. So it all started with four locations we acquired in the Phoenix, Arizona market. And a lot of additional acquisitions and there was a lot of new store development. But in a franchise system, you have the ability or you have the luxury to follow somebody else's uh, blueprint or game plan so you know, you have checklists for everything. You have checklists for how to receive goods, how to train people, everything. Of course, today it's gotten a little bit easier because of technology. We have things like learning management systems and you know videos that are easily uh, used to train people and where all franchise brands are looking to get people up to speed and trained quicker than ever before. I mean, that was always a goal, but with technology, that's easy. So in a nutshell, Fridays was my jumping off period. It wasn't my company. I didn't have equity. It was an uncle. Uh, and it was an incredible experience, five and a half years from nothing to 225 million, like I said earlier in 1992, to go, wow, what is, look, look what is possible. And I traveled the country and, and, you know, went to Dallas, went to the corporate office and listened to the seasonal menu changes and all these things. But look, the bottom line is every company has got to stay fresh and relevant. And Fridays didn't. Their leadership changed. Chili's and Applebee's and Fridays were competing for the dwindling casual dining market when Panera Bread and Five Guys and all these other fast casuals, as they're called today, mm. people realized if they're going to sit down, it better be something great. Otherwise, it's not worth it. And the experience started to wane and lack. I didn't stick around for any of that. I saw that coming and I was gone moving on to other things. But, you know, look, everybody listening when it comes to how to do these things, it's all about people, Anthony. It's all about people. Nobody builds an empire on their own. Although I saw something interesting, I think it was last night, that because of AI, somebody's claiming that someone will become the first billionaire literally working all by themselves mm -hmm. because of AI and its capabilities. Don't know if that's true or not or ever going to happen, but the reality is everybody listening more than likely has people doing the work and AI can be helpful. In the world of franchising, there's a ton of service-based businesses and we will never be uh, out of business because of Amazon or AI AI will certainly enhance the experience. It's not going to hurt it. So those are those are a couple of highlights, uh, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that, you know, as we think like, you know, traditional, I say air quotes, traditional versus franchisee businesses are more similar than I think they are different. And then, you know, like the question is like, how how do you be a successful franchisee? Like obviously following the system, but you know, like you said, and especially for like a food brand, but all franchisee franchises is like, it's people in there. So yeah. what would you say in your experience, you know, defines a good leader and I could say, you know, caveat within a franchise system, but I'm sure that there's parallels between franchises and non-franchises, but let's just stick. What makes a good yeah. leader within a franchisee type system? Yeah. And let me take it back one step. I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, whether you're starting your own business or following a franchise system, um, it's, it's all the same fundamentals. The reality is that most people don't have an original idea or concept that really needs to be launched. Hmm. We, we've we watched enough Shark Tank and you know heard Mr. Wonderful say that's a hobby, that's not a business. 
you know, does the world really need your solution? And, and franchising is, is following that proven method. As far as leadership goes, it's pretty simple from my standpoint. If you are a great leader, you are willing to do the hard stuff. You're willing to set the example, to set the pace, to set the standards. But it all truly starts with when you hire your first employee. Building that core team is the most critical thing in the world. We're all going to have turnover always. However, it's that core team, the people closest to you, the people that are most important to you. What I ask CEOs of any size company, the first question is, if you were going to close down tomorrow temporarily, just because, and you were going to restaff the entire company, and you only had the current people that work for you to choose from, I want you to rank them as to who you would call back first and why. And it's pretty amazing that a lot of business owners struggle with really truly who their best people are, or maybe they have one or two that are great, and then the rest are like, eh. And I was like, well, there's your problem. <laughs> because you should be fighting to determine that there's you know 50 people that are your best or second best or third best or whatever it might be. But being a leader is all about really listening to your employees when you from the hiring stage where a lot of people make big and critical mistakes is they hire the wrong people in the first place. And then they have all these false beliefs and expectations of what these people can do. And they waste a lot of time. We've all probably heard my favorite expression on hiring. You hire slowly and you fire fast. Hire slow, fire fast. I could tell you stories on how I've hired and have been very successful and very unique ways to hire people. Like at one of my restaurants, I had a key person that would be in management sitting at our counter while we were in the middle of a busy lunch rush. And I had them specifically come through one of these stores at the at the middle of the middle of the lunch rush. And I pretended to be too busy that I couldn't talk to them because we were so busy. This was all a setup. And they sat at the counter and one of my key staff actually interviewed the person and the person didn't know they were being interviewed for the job by that individual. They were thinking it was me. And guess what? That person failed the culture test. It just, it, it, it didn't work. Right. It didn't work. So I'm very creative like that because at the end of the day, guess what happens? We all know, and a lot of people listening know this, people that you're interviewing are on guard. They're, they have prepared answers, canned responses. Our job is to figure out what's really true in what they're saying or who just taught them to respond that way. And that's why I love to hire people that are employed. So if you want another tip or trick of mine, I'll give it to you. Sure. Well, I, I have a slightly different question and I, want, if, if you don't mind. Your is, show, of course. What, what I find interesting or what I was thinking around. Uh, so you had said, you know, listening to your employees is critical. And in a franchise system, one might take the case that there are many things that cannot be changed. And I'm sure that there's some things that can be changed in some big organizations that might be very large enterprises. There are certain things that cannot be changed. Their systems, processes, their structure. And then, so I guess the question is, how do you balance having employees feel heard, feel supported in a system and structure that is, we'll call it relatively static or fixed? How do you balance that? Here's what we can change. Here's what we can't change. And it might speak to the culture or it might speak to something else. This has a lot to do with going back to the hiring process, because I'll give you an example based on that question. At Krispy Kreme Donuts, they had some pretty poor systems. They were a long established company that had a very bad operations manual in the early days. And we helped change that. So listening to employees or observing, I saw a lot of new bakers make bad donuts. And then I realized it was the procedures and the training that was the problem. So it wasn't so much listening, it was observing and realizing I had to jump in and help the staff to determine why are new bakers screwing this process up 
so much. Where, where are we missing it? And we readjusted the training materials and the training guides to ensure that they wouldn't make those same mistakes. Now, let me, let me just add something. When it comes to a franchise or an independent business, standards are standards established by the owner of the brand. So just because McDonald's says that a burger has to be cooked an exact way to an exact temperature and served within a certain period of time, otherwise it's thrown out so somebody doesn't get an ice cold burger, whatever it might be, the bun has to be toasted to this color, all these things. Standards are standards in any company. What I did as a franchisee to be a top performer is, you know, when it came to customer service, not everything is scripted at every single franchise. There might be guidelines that could be scripted on how an air conditioning tech, my favorite air conditioning franchise, which is called One Hour Heating and Air Conditioning, they might have certain upselling procedures and certain things to enhance the sales process and address the speed of certain things. But at the end of the day, giving amazing customer service and follow-up there's never a replacement for where most people fall short is still where most people fall short, poor customer service, poor follow-up, mm -hmm. um, rude behavior from a staff, things like that. Um, you know, people leave companies, not because of the company, they leave people. Yeah. They don't like their environment. So hopefully that answered that. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I'm actually taking away from this is, you know, we had a guy in our podcast, Chris Roncio, who runs Trainual, and he's big on, you know, yeah, yeah, of course. Pro processes. But what I find interesting is how you had shared it in, in the example of McDonald's. We talk about brand standards. Most think of people, or I think most people think of brand standards as, as here's our colors, here's our logo versus here's our expectation or here's our minimum when we deliver our product, yes. when we deliver our service, here's the level that we want it to be. Above the level is great or at the level below is not. And then yes. there's the guidelines as in here's the kind of guardrails you play within that. And then here's the processes. And so a lot of times people think of like processes, systems, standards as a thing that's like constraining. But in this case, you know, it, it should in principle allow you to do your best work consistently. And then for the brand owner, and again, like let's say you are the CEO of a business and let's say you're owner CEO, you own the business. So what you're putting in place are the standards for your business yes. versus just training protocols or checklists. It's focusing on the standard at the top of it. Yeah. Does that la land with you, Lance? A absolutely. And including speed, speed of service, all of that. And whether it's QSR, you know, quick serve restaurants like McDonald's or one hour heating and air conditioning. And let me throw in a very quick story. Uh, I was a big student of organizational development, organizational design, and I studied, studied with some PhDs years ago on this subject. And it fits perfectly with what you're talking about. They did a study of schoolyard kids. You know, a classic schoolyard when you go out in this and, and, and play in the schoolyard? Mm -hmm. And there's always a fence, but there's a lot of room to play, but there's a fence. Where do kids typically play in any schoolyard in America in that setup? All over the yard, right? There are kids hanging on the fence. There are kids in the middle. There are kids all over the place. Well, they did a study and they removed the fence. They removed the fence. Where did the kids hang out now? Was there a change? Absolutely, there was a change. There were no kids hanging out where that fence was because there's no barrier, there's no guideline, there's no security. Nobody was that far. Everybody huddled closer to the building. Mm. And that is exactly what it's like in an organization where there's appropriate training and standards. Employees, I know I was comparing to kids, same idea. Kids grow up to be adults. Same idea. The These adults in every great organization with great standards and great expectations and great training will innovate, go out, push themselves. Without that and the poor culture, they're going to huddle close to that building and the results will not be the same. Yeah. And I, even the flip side of that, as I think about it, but I was a soccer kid, so I played on the corner against the two fences. Uh, but the fences should keep you safe. Right. If you play outside of the fence, that's where the, the alleyway is. That's where cars are. That's it's where scary. Yeah. And so like as a brand <laughs> owner, the fence is to protect people and to, to have everybody be successful. And so putting those things in place to help your be employees be supported, 
they can see it one of two ways. They could see it as a constraint or they could see it as a way to keep them uh, successful. And then as a leader, um, it's on you to be able to explain not just the what, but the why of that. Okay, let's let's talk about you as a CEO, Lance. What are some of, uh, what are two or three things that you're um, working on in terms of your own development? So of course you're doing a bunch of stuff, but what are you working on personally to help you improve, uh, become a better CEO, become a better leader? Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I'm always reading, always reading a, a new book or two. And at the end of the day, it's helping my team be successful. I have several full-time employees, some part-time employees. But you know, even back in the old days when I had big organizations and I had 700 employees and we're doing millions and do millions of dollars in business across multiple states, you know, for me, it's all about how do I support my staff to be better? And I always encourage my staff, spend 10% of the time. I don't care if it's a franchise or not, 10% of the time innovating. Let me give you an example of what we came up with at a Krispy Kreme donut shop a million years ago. It feels like a million years ago. We put a, a camera in the speaker post. We were the first people I never knew anything. Of a drive through you mean? In a drive through yep. We put a hidden camera in the speaker post of the drive through Why? Because the staff can now relate to the individual they're speaking to. They can see their body language. They can see their face. They can see if they're actually paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, in Utah, where there's a lot of kids and families, you know, uh, the, the uh, a lot of moms were having to reach in the back seat while they were ordering, talking to the kids. And, you know, so whatever we can do to innovate and support the staff to make their job easier. Cause that's our job as a leader is to how, how do you make somebody's job easier with technology today? I mean, it, there's so many ways, every organization that's smart is talking about how AI can help or how AI can hurt. <laughs> what do our customers want and things like that. So for me, it's forever innovating. I've always done i've always spent a percentage of my time i drive my wife nuts who works for me because she's a lot more conservative than me honey just focus on that on your list and i said i am i am but i need to focus on new stuff otherwise i'm gonna have nothing on my list after that i need to always have something in process or in progress if you will yeah. So I, what I hear out of that is, you know, even for, we'll call it established, proven, tested organizations, whether that's a franchise or not, you know, of course, sticking to what you know and doing that well and making sure that you meet the standard, but also looking, hey, where can we improve? I, I think we're never too confident to say- we're Never perfect. settle. So how can you as a leader, you know, look at innovating while also, you know, putting those structures in place to, to support your people? ultimately deliver that high highest level of customer experience. Anthony, uh, it's grow or die. That's it. There we go. Lance, uh, time flies when we're having fun. So we're close to the end of our interview here. But if people want to learn more about how to be a great leader, if they want to learn more about entering the world of franchising, if they want to connect with you personally, uh, where do they go and where can they learn more about what you're doing? I'm everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Lance Gralick. You can certainly uh, DM me Anthony as the keyword. Uh, I have a great assessment. So there's two, two final thoughts for me on this. I have a great free assessment. If you're interested in being your own boss, uh, I do have a great assessment. It helps me and you understand your life uh, experiences, mindset, skill set. Uh, amazing assessment. And it only takes about 15 minutes. It's on my website at lancegrowlick.com and I own franchising.com. A lot of independent business owners out there. I set up franchise systems. I have a big team that does that. Franchising your business, the exits today are insane. It used to be for years, a franchisor can sell their business for 10 times EBITDA, 10 times cash flow. Nowadays, we're seeing exits as high as 30 times cash flow. So if you have an independent business that you're proud of, that is a great business, happy to talk to you about setting it up for franchising. It's not that expensive. It's a great investment in you and an easy way to grow and scale across the country compared to you doing it all yourself. Awesome. Well, price is only an issue in the absence of value. So if you can uh, deliver something great for your people and you can support, you know, society and customers at the same point, um, that's excellent. So Lance, thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate you sharing. Uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing more about what you get up to in the community. Thank you so much for having me, Anthony.
That's my pleasure. Folks, my guest today, Lance Growlick, lancegrowlick.com, supporting franchisees and franchisors all over North America. One of the things I'm taking away from this is the idea of the fence in the in the schoolyard. You know, without the fence, people will gravitate to the middle. It doesn't support your customers. It doesn't support them in being successful. And it limits your total capacity to have impact on your customers. The other is, you know, what are you doing to innovate? Um, spend a bit of your time continuously innovating so that you can keep pushing forward and, and maintain your relevance, unlike potentially some other brands that didn't do that. So folks, my guest again, Lance Growlick, my name, Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you being here and spending time with both of us today. And see you next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.